You can tell it's a morning recording. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen. Oh, so early. Why do we keep doing this? It's an email as a podcast made possible by M Particle. This is the Friday morning show, apparently, that reviews the most shocking media and retail news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. Social media regulation is kind of coming. Everyone's confusion, including the people on this podcast, me included, is a reflection of just the kind of nightmare scenario that I think these technology companies have concocted for themselves. Will virtual try-on ever take off? If you're going to, you know, try on a pair of sneakers, for example, I imagine comfort would be a huge consideration in whether or not you're going to buy that thing. How not to interrupt the consumer? So, you know, by all means, when you're in these entirely new environments like TikTok, you need to think differently and try and become part of that conversation again. Formula One's new popularity, an unpopular opinion about in-store sales, and some random trivia about sea creatures. All right, folks, join me for this episode. We have three people. Let's meet them. We start with our senior director of briefings. It's Stephanie Taglianetti. Hey, happy to be back for my second appearance. Welcome back, Stephanie. We're also joined by one of our, uh, also joined by our director of reports editing. It's Rahul Chada. Hi, thanks for having me. Hello there. And finally, we have our principal analyst covering the UK. It's Bill Fisher. Hello, Marcus. Hello, sir. Also host of Around the World, uh, one of the other behind the numbers shows. This is his first weekly listen. Welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for being here. We're normally way more put together. <laughs> We're not, that's not true. <laughs> Today's episode, what do we have in store for you? Well, there's four segments on the menu as usual. We start with the story of the week. We're talking about social media regulation. Is it actually finally, maybe, possibly here? Probably not. We then move to the game of the week where our contestants go head to head to head to try and give us the best takeaways they can from each of the four stories we have for you. We then move to uncommon knowledge. We have an unpopular opinion about in-store retail sales. And then the party data where we talk about some random trivia things we just recently learned that we need to share with you so we start with the story of the week is social media regulation on its way well back in april european lawmakers reached a new deal on social media regulations the digital services act or dsa is set to introduce a variety of requirements for online platforms including standards for taking down illegal content a ban on targeted advertising aimed at children and new obligations on vetting third-party sellers other things as well very large platforms defined as those serving more than 45 million users in the EU would also be expected to complete risk assessments and allow regulators to access the algorithms they use to determine what content users see. And so its counterpart, the Digital Markets Act, that's a DMA, that was agreed to on March and would come into play next spring. That will impose new competition rules and sizable fines on the world's biggest tech companies. But as James Vincent of The Verge explains, the DSA, Services Act, Digital Services Act, should not be confused with the DMA, the Digital Markets Act. Both acts affect the tech world, but the DMA focuses on creating a level playing field between businesses. The DSA deals with how companies police content on their platforms. The DSA is likely to have more immediate impacts on internet users as a result. So takeaways, folks. Bill, I'll come to you first because you're closest to this being in the UK. What's your biggest uh, reaction? Well, I'll, I'll bring it even closer to me, if I may. In, in the UK, yeah. we've got the similar thing to the DSA, which is the Online Safety Bill, which was just introduced to UK Parliament earlier this month, I believe, so very mm. recently. And it, man, it's complicated. I mean, as you, <laughs> you know, as you said there, you've got the DSA, the DMA, all these acronyms. So the Online Safety Bill is 225 pages long. Great. It's actually the next iteration of the Online Harms Bill, which was introduced to Parliament in 2019. And of mm. course, this bill is now going to be debated and probably changed again. So as yep. you said at the top of the show, is is regulation coming? Maybe, but probably not yet. Yeah. But, but it is underway. And yeah, the, you know, it, I, I tried to understand this thing. I can't. It's so dense. But the key takeaway I get from the Online Safety Bill is that it, it's regulation, but not as we know it, it's, it's about ensuring companies have systems and processes in place to ensure its users' safety, um, mm -hmm. and, and as opposed to having uh, to being fined for, for falling foul of regulation, mm -hmm. it's about these companies or gatekeepers to content, as they're referred to in the bill. They have to prove that they have systems in place to recognise different types of content and do something about it. So that there are three categories: there's illegal content. 
which is pretty obvious. And then you've got legal content, but harmful to children and legal content, but harmful to adults. And it's that last one that's the real tricky one. Right. Because right. we know what illegal content is. I mean, if if I go down to Speaker's Corner um, in, in London and mm-hmm. stand on a box and spout some hate speech, I'll be arrested. If I do that mm-hmm. online, the same. But there's nothing to stop me, for example, to use a, a real example, going online and making a link between, say, COVID vaccines and AIDS. But there's a harmful element to it. You know, if people don't want to get vaccinated against COVID because they're worried they might catch AIDS, then that's causing harm. So this is right. this is where these bills, it becomes really difficult to know how they're going to be policed. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming the online safety bill is mirrors or they've tried to make it mirror the Digital Services Act. They're very similar. The UK okay. government would like to tell you that they want the UK to be the tightest regulators on online safety. Um, okay. Because, you know, that we're, we're having debates with the EU on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> right. But it's exactly it's the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Okay. Okay. So yeah, there's lots of parts to this. There's, you know, the largest platforms they're going to have to perform yearly analysis for the Digital Services Act, reducing risk associated with spreading illegal content, the impacts to the democratic process, the mental health of users. So yearly analysis on those things. Online marketplaces will have a new duty of care, obligating them to new transparency rules. Misleading interfaces, sometimes called dark patterns, will be prohibited under the DSA. Platforms must let users opt out of recommendations based on their history and other information. And then there are new rules around responding to misinformation about breaking news events and protection measures for minors. There's so much in here. Stephanie, what's your takeaway from all this? I need a sec because I myself have confused it with the DMA. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. I mean, I was <laughs> I was really drilling down on the DMA and what that meant and, you know, how the briefing scene has been covered. So I need a sec to kind of collect my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. That's okay because, yeah, I mean, the fact that they named them almost <laughs> the same thing, <laughs> you would think wouldn't be the smartest idea, but they did it anyway. Uh, Rahul, how about you? I think this is a just uh, all, everyone's confusion, including the people on this podcast, me included, is a reflection of just the kind of nightmare scenario that I think these technology companies have concocted for themselves. You know, the mm-hmm. idea for companies is always let's self-regulate before the government gets to it and makes it a nightmare for us. And now they're going to have to deal with an increasingly complicated patchwork. You know, I'm less familiar with the stuff going on in the UK and the EU, mm-hmm. uh, but even in the United States, it's like the stuff's rolling out at the a state level in this patchwork quilt that's going to be a nightmare for uh, compliance for these companies. At the federal level, again, we've talked about this before. I'm I'm not still not convinced, you know, tech companies have become a convenient political punching bag for both the right and the left for different reasons, but they can't get their stuff together to come up with a piece of legislation that would achieve any of their goals, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think really the tech companies are going to work to weaken something at a federal level that would supersede any kind of state level legislation. But, you know, I think the bottom line takeaway for me is like, it's a confusing swamp of regulations and the companies are going to be stuck with a bunch of like compliance headaches, I think. And consumers are probably going to remain confused about everything, you know? And this is just an instance of like the regulations really lagging the technology. Like, you know, I read stories sometimes about facial recognition and I'm like, wait, there are private companies who can harvest my face online and do what they will with that biometric data. You know, I think the regulations are really lagging uh, and, you know, I think consumers are being done a disservice as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think to Raul's point, there's, you know, this inclination where consumers, they want to know that their information is secure, that it's protected, that there's things being done to protect the spread of misinformation. But at the same time, it all kind of goes above your head. You don't really understand the Mm -hmm. nature of the environment and everything that's going on with all of these regulations. So I don't know, this is something that my team's definitely going to continue to watch. Yeah. Yeah, Kim McCrail of the Wall Street Journal, she was noting that the DSA could serve as an example for other countries. Uh, for example, Europe has been the first mover on regulations in the past, like its landmark privacy legislation, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. But also Celia Kang of the New York Times says, kind of getting at what uh, Rahul, you were just mentioning, the US may be the birthplace of the iPhone and most widely used search engine and social network. It could also bring the world into the so-called metaverse, but global leadership on tech regulations is taking place more than 3,000 miles from Washington by European leaders representing 27 nations with 24 languages who have nonetheless been able to agree on basic online protections for their 450 million 
or so citizens in Europe. In America, Congress has not passed a single piece of comprehensive regulation to protect internet consumers and to rein in the power of technology giants. Over 25 years, dozens of federal privacy bills have been proposed and then ultimately dropped without bipartisan support. Uh, she notes, Celia Kang notes that um, it took decades of public anger to regulate the railroads through the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887. It took nearly 50 years from the first medical reports on the dangers of cigarettes to the regulation of tobacco. Um, and I was just looking up, Amazon's 28 years old, Google is 24, and Facebook is only 18 years old. So it could still be a while yet. Final thing to note on the DSA, platforms that fail to follow the rules could be subject to fines of up to 6% of their gross revenue, which for tech giants could be billions of dollars. It still needs final approval from the EU parliament, representatives from EU countries, but that's unlikely to result in any further significant changes. Kim McCrell of the Wall Street Journal was saying the rules will apply to all companies 15 months after the act is voted into law or from January 1st, 2024, whichever is later. All right, that's all we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. First quick word from our sponsor, MParticle. At the end of the day, your customer has to be at the center of everything you do. This starts with the right customer data strategy as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit success, such as data quality, data governance, and connectivity. MParticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps you accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your customer data from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. See why the best brands choose MParticle. Go to www www.mpasscool.com All right, folks, we are back. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what's the point? Where I read out four stories and have contestants, Stephanie, Bill, and Rahul, tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay answers get one point, good answers get two, and answers that give you the same feeling as climbing into fresh sheets. <laughs> answers that leave you with that feeling. They get you three points. Each person gets 20 seconds to answer before they hear this. If you run long on your answer, you get a yellow card. It's normally a technical foul, but I've modified it for Bill. Thank you. Uh, and minus, <laughs> and you get minus two <laughs> points as well with that yellow card. Two yellows gets you a red. It's your red card and gets you sent off or ejected from the game, if you will. Whoever's the most points after the end of the game wins. It gets the last word. We start with Stephanie. For the first round, will virtual try on ever take off? Snapchat's dress up feature turns your phone into an AR shopping mall, making it easier to virtually try on almost anything, writes David Pierce of The Verge. When you open the dress up hub and pick up an item, you can try it on through Snap's AR lenses. Take a picture of how it looks on you and share it with folks. Dress up will also have creator content as well as tips and ideas from brands all changing based on what you like, how you use the platform, and even where you're located, says Mr. Pierce. But Stephanie, will virtual try-on ever take off? What's the point? I mean, I think it's cool, but I don't see the utility beyond that, especially if it's supposed to influence a buying decision. If you're going to you know, try on a pair of sneakers, for example, I imagine comfort would be a huge consideration and whether or not you're going to buy that thing. And I immediately think of how something like virtual try-on could actually escalate the problem that we have with returns, right? People are very willing to buy something, return it if they don't like it. And uh, apparel actually has the second highest return rate in retail categories. So I mm. think virtual try-on could just escalate a problem like that. Stephanie's like, when did comfort stop mattering? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rahul, you're up. Yeah, I think it's possible maybe this will catch on, but I don't think we're there yet. You know, I think um, one of the reasons is that people are going back into stores, according to the uh, U.S. Commerce De- uh, Department data. And so it kind of obviates the need for a, a virtual try-on if you are willing to go to a store and put the garment on in, in the real world. I also think that, you know, there's still a gap in terms of widespread AR adoption, people actually using these tools. Like we estimate only about a quarter of the U.S. population uses AR once a month. I did think actually that Snap's features might have been a play more to appeal to uh, sellers of clothing. So they're, you know, their play is, hey, we have this whiz bang feature, upload your product catalog. Our users can like do Mm -hmm. this virtual try on thing and we'll both make some money. So I don't know, that might have been the motivation here for Snap. Bill. Yep, I agree with Steph. I think it's a bit of a fad. It will remain niche at best. I'm actually reminded of a question I was asked at a job interview several decades ago now about the future of reading and books. Will books go out of fashion? I was asked. I called it then. I said, no, 
people always want to have the physical form in their hands. And I think that applies to clothes, you know, AR is fun, interesting, but it's never going to replace the reality of putting an item on, seeing it, feeling it there and then. So it has legs, but it will never become mainstream. Mm. Uh, Snap said that AR shopping lenses have been used over 5 billion times by over 250 million Snapchat users. So numbers like that make you make it seem like this is a big deal. There's some data, though, that corresponds with roughly what Rahul was saying in terms of usage. 24% of folks in Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the UK and the US said they've used AR tech for virtual try-on. 24% according to Bazaar Voices December 2021 research and also 21% of US adults said they've used virtual shopping tools like AR try-on. That was from the Harry Paris poll, January of this year. So still, yeah, nowhere near uh, majority uh, usage on this stuff. Round two, we start with Rahul. How not to interrupt consumers. In his new book, Exponential, author Jeff Rosenblum thinks brands need to redefine advertising's role. He notes that the world's most iconic brands have built armies of evangelists by using data, creativity, and technology to deliver empowerment rather than superficial, interruptive messaging but says he's amazed at how many people in his industry act as if folks are still sitting patiently through TV ads, admiring the flashy laptop banner ads, or watching closely as a YouTube pre-roll displays the video they want to see. He thinks educational content is a way to empower potential consumers instead of interrupting them. While it might not earn an automaker any creativity awards, he says, functional content can clearly communicate a product's features and functionality, removes purchase barriers, and drives momentum through the purchase journey. But Rahul, how not to interrupt consumers? What's the point? Yeah, I think there's a lot of like no duh conclusions. People get annoyed by advertising. You know, I think he's describing a, a lot of old concepts and new phrases. He's basically describing to me content marketing, create content that draws in people. The supposed benefits of digital advertising are using data to target the right audience with the right message at the right time. And this idea of authenticity is really just about brand building. What's your brand and how are you resonating with your consumers? But, you know, the fundamental issue is that you've got to do all those things. And I think you also have to build your brand with, you know, the legacy TV ad or whatever it is that's going to get you scale. That's an important part of the equation. If it was easy, people would be executing on it flawlessly all the time. It is not. It's hard. You have a finite budget. you got to figure out where, where to allocate your money. And, you know, I think depending on what the product is you're trying to sell and who you're trying to reach, these are just, it's just a grab bag of tools you got to reach into and figure out what works for you. Mm-hmm. Bill? Yeah, um, I agree with Rahul. It's, it's like a dough. Of course, no one likes advertising. If you can, and this is in big air quotes, get in on the conversation with people rather than just hitting them with advertising interruption, then sure, that's a good idea. But then, you know, some of the best advertising is interruptive. Um, a lot of advertising is event advertising. You know, the, the Super Bowl ads that people tune into or the, the John Lewis Christmas ad that people have been waiting all year for if you're in the UK. So, you know, by all means, when you're in these entirely new environments like TikTok, you need to think differently and try and become part of that conversation again in, in air quotes. I don't really like that phrase. But interruptive advertising, I think, still has a place. Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, I'll reiterate the duh. I didn't feel like I learned a ton by reading that article, but at least, you know, when they wrote, you know, focus on empowering consumers, my mind immediately went to like eliciting that response, like buying sustainably that makes people feel happy. And if you can kind of feed into those emotions, but the main takeaway is consumers have a higher standards of brands, comedy and clever ads don't really influence buying decisions. And there's a much higher expectation than that. Mm -hmm. Halfway through the game, it's all tied up, five points each. Now we move to our third round. We start with Bill. Is the shipping experience the new frontier of e-commerce? Eduardo Lopez Soriano, VP of Marketing for UPS Capital, just wrote a sponsored content piece in Retail Dive. In it, he outlined a recent survey of 1,000 US adults and 500 US-based small to medium-sized businesses on shipping experience preferences. It found a number of things, but two of them that jumped out to me, nearly nine in 10 people would be more likely to shop with a merchant who offers a personalized shipping experience, things like picking the arrival date or adding insurance. And seven out of 10 people said they'd pay extra for that. And the second point was eight out of 10 people would prefer shipping personalization options over two day or free day shipping. Sorry, free day. Free shipping. <laughs> Still so early. <laughs> Mr. Lopez Soriano suggests these were once the gold standard in e-commerce, two day and free day. It's free. I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Kill me. Free shipping. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Gold standard in e-commerce. And that this shows folks are rethinking the perks of free or fast delivery and looking for more oversight over their shipments. But 
Bill, is the shipping experience the new frontier of e-commerce? What's the point? Yes, yes, yes. There's such a disconnect at the moment between a retailer and the shipping partner, and it's really frustrating. This is from a UK perspective. So I can order an item from retailer X, say I press the button for free shipping, I said it right, um, or next day delivery or whatever the option is on offer. And the experience I get is a bit of a lucky dip until I get the email or text message from the shipping provider saying that that's who I've got. I don't know who the shipper is. Without naming names, when I see that it's shipping partner Y, I might want to punch a wall because I have no idea when it's going to arrive. <laughs> if I see that I've got shipping partner Z, I do a little dance because I know I could get multiple <laughs> helpful messages along the distribution chain. It's kind of a dance, Bill. I'm not going to show you. Um, okay, right. But sure. I could get, you, I'm going to get a red card for this now because of these interruptions. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 you're good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll shut up. Um, so if I get shipping partner Z, I'm going to do a little dance, which I won't show you because... <laughs> I can get multiple messages along the distribution chain. I can even, from some shipping providers, I can track the driver on the day of delivery in the UK. Get that. So yes, wow. it's the next frontier. Nice. For, uh, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, next frontier, but not like going to be enough to get people to come shop with you, right? I can see why shipping would not have influence on where you buy. So I see the appeal, but don't think it's going to be like a competitive draw. I think that would have to be stock and price, and brand reputation. Mm-hmm. Rahul. I agree with Stephanie. I think, you know, when it comes to shipping, the bar you got to hit is fast and free and Amazon set the standard in the States at least that way. Beyond that, you know, these guys talking about personalization, I'm not buying it. I don't think anybody really cares that much about like, oh, is it really easy to buy insurance for this thing? Or, you know, can I maybe can I choose the day it's delivered? Most people just want it fast. They're willing to wait for their packages or whatever. That's table stakes. I think our own research on benchmarks, you know, I'm thinking of something that um, Blake Droge or one of our e-commerce analyst uh, a report he wrote about is on subscription e-commerce you know it's like these are table stakes people expect fast free shipping and if you want to differentiate you got to go beyond that we move into our final rounds uh, bill is just out ahead of the other two folks um, it's all to play for because it's double points in the final round double points formula one's new popularity we'll start with stephanie formula one's newfound western popularity presents brand opportunities, writes Insider Intelligence Analyst Daniel Konstantinovich. Formula One, Americans, okay, is when cars drive around a track that's not just turning left like NASCAR, <laughs> all right? It's actually actual competitive driving. Just letting you know. Okay, Miami's debut Grand Prix uh, broke viewership records for Formula One in the US. Viewership for the Miami hosted one of the races this year, and it doesn't normally is the point. Viewership for the ABC broadcasted event peaked at 2.9 million and averaged 2.6 million, according to ESPN. The previous viewership record came back in 1995, was around 40 percent smaller. And it, uh, it wasn't just this race, uh, Daniel notes, viewership is on pace to surpass 2021, which was this year's viewership, uh, which was the most viewed F1 season on US TV. But Stephanie, Formula One's new popularity, what's the point? Uh, yeah, I mean, you asked, does this present a brand opportunity? So yes, it seems like they have a young audience, like there's an opportunity to take advantage of the space while it's growing in popularity. But you know, for me, what I thought was the coolest takeaway here was actually Netflix's ability to spark interest in a live sponsored event. A lot of the rising popularity of F1 was attributed to that Netflix documentary. So I think that's a really cool strategy and something to think about there. Mm -hmm. Drive to survive. Uh, Rahul. Yeah, that was the same thing that jumped out at me. It speaks to the power of well-executed content marketing. I don't know if that was the intention of F1, but it seems <laughs> to have yielded a really uh, useful result for them in the U.S. You know, it seems like they've tried a couple of times to break in the U.S. market and failed. And now they've successfully done that. And it made me think about soccer. Is there any chance that if somebody created a captivating docu-series about soccer, it could actually generate like more <laughs> widespread interest in the U.S.? I don't know. I also got to note that I feel like whenever you throw in a sports-related issue in the game, I'm getting handicapped. I don't know if it's intentional <laughs> on your part. I'm notoriously ignorant of all things sports, but that's what I think. It's on purpose. Bill. <laughs> Yeah, so you're talking to European here, so F1 is part of my psyche. And uh, yes. brand advertising, has, uh, it's, it's always been a huge business in the sport. In the 70s and 80s, the cars were like giant cigarette packets emblazoned with the tobacco company's logos. But, you know, that was an issue in itself. But there's a bit of an issue with the sport now, in my opinion, and that's the environmental impact that it has. And some of the big names in the sport have started 
speaking out about this, Sebastian Vettel, most recently. So yes, mm. there, there's no doubt a huge opportunity here, and it's a, it's a global one now, but the messaging is important. It might actually only be right for certain brands, and those brands that do make moves in this area need to be very careful with their branding in any case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could gain more popularity in the US just because of the races they're putting on. Two US races are added to the F1 calendar, Miami this year, Vegas next year, 2023. There'll be a Formula One race there. So if they keep Miami, I'm not sure if they keep Miami for next year, but then you'll have Miami, you'll have Vegas, and you'll obviously have Austin as well, which is already on the calendar. I think they just need an American driver. They need People need someone to get behind and to cheer. So I think when that comes into effect, maybe more people will want to support or get involved in the sport. All right, that's all we've got time for for the game of the week. This week's winner, a drum roll. Who could it be? Bill is this week's winner of the game of the week. Congratulations to Bill. He, 14 points, Rahul 13, Stephanie 11. What do I win? So it was close, but Bill won. You win. <laughs> Straight to A, Bill. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. What the hell do I, what the hell do I get? Uh, you get the championship belt, which, I mean, really means nothing. Okay. But is uh, yeah, it's a it's a thing we used to have in the studio. But you you can pretend that you've got that, and then uh, you also get the final word, which is where you get thirty seconds of free airtime to tell us anything you want, any research you've been working on, any podcast you've been listening to recently, any TV series you want to talk about. Up to you. The floor is yours. What now? Yeah, yeah, right now. All oh, right. I didn't. I, mean, I didn't know that was the prize, so I have to think of something. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to tell. Um. <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to win, Bill. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, Okay, I've got one. Right, so I follow this group. It's called the Accentism Project. So I've spoken about this before on my podcast. I'm a linguistics and modern English language major. So I'm really interested in language and, and, and the English language in particular. And we all speak with an accent. This is a big thing in the UK uh, in particular. So we have lots of regional accents and there's a lot of accentism. So if you have a particular accent, if you're from the Northwest or the Northeast, you are viewed as being less intelligent than if you speak with BBC English or received pronunciation. But BBC English is in itself a accent. So there you go. BBC English? Yeah. Really? <laughs> You've never heard of that? No, no. Yeah, shorthand for received pronunciation. You've, you've heard of RP though, right? No. Maybe it's just... It's like I'm not even from England. (laughs) (laughs) Please let me come back. (laughs) All right, very good. That's all we've got time for for the game of the week. It's time now for Uncommon Knowledge. Uh, Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, the segment where we offer up some unpopular or atypical opinions about things. We start with an unpopular opinion from the BBC Radio 1 feature. This was inspired by. Then we have an unpopular opinion from the internet. And finally, we get an unpopular opinion from one of our um, panel related to the media world. We start with unpopular opinion. Uh, First of our three comes from the BBC Radio 1 feature. uh, And it is, it's okay to ghost someone after a couple of dates. That's horrible. No, I, I remember I got in this argument when I was like really in like the height of my online dating days. Uh, I got into like an argument with a coworker because I told her that sometimes when I didn't feel a spark, I would just send a message. And I was like, yeah, this is the tough adult thing to do to like just talk to someone. You'd be like, hey, just so they would know what was going on. Because I got ghosted so many times. It is like a crucial blow to your self-esteem. Like who thinks that's yeah. okay? <laughs> Wait, they were arguing that it was okay? And it was okay. She, she was trying to avoid the uncomfortable conversation. Right. And look, I got to acknowledge that there are dynamics with like cishet relationships with females specifically in terms of safety and all that kind of stuff. So I understand sometimes why there are reasons why people do it. But I think as a man in those kinds of situations, it was always my responsibility to like just tell people what was going on. Yeah. Yep. That was my one caveat, Raul. It totally depends on the circumstance. If you're not feeling like threatened by that person and you know, you had like an okay time, there's just no spark. As you've said, it's the decent thing to do as a human being, somebody that you've spent time with to just let them know, not keep them wondering. But of course there are all sorts of constituencies about like, you know, comfort and perceived threat that I could understand why that would be the move to ghost. <laughs> Every time Bill contacts me uh, once a month to work out what he's going to be talking about on your show, I ghost him all the time. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Bill. Uh, Bill, any thoughts? Is it okay? Is it not okay? No, it's not acceptable, Marcus. Okay, all right. (laughs) (laughs) Marcus, it's not acceptable. (laughs) Respond to my bloody emails. Uh, All right, I've got one more for you uh, before we get to the serious one. This is from the internet. Milk is disgusting. And anyone caught, dr- and, any- 
<laughs> and anyone caught drinking it should have to leave Earth. <laughs> How do we feel? It's a very strict penalty. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very specific penalty. I don't mind a glass of milk, but it needs to be paired with a cookie. How about warm milk? Do oh. you warm your milk before you drink it? <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm Milk as a drink, as a standalone drink, is like really confusing and I think just speaks to the power of like the dairy lobby in America. Remember those got milk commercials you used to see all yeah. the time? Yeah. Uh, in cereal, I'm like totally a fan. I'm like, yeah, I'm a huge fan of cereal. It's like a great all day meal sometimes when I'm feeling lazy, but as a standalone drink, yeah, I'm not a fan. I sometimes need it after something really spicy though. It's like, mm. it's like, an, it's just to alleviate that palate. That's the, yeah. I think that's the only time I would drink a glass of dairy milk. <laughs> it's hard to pull off as an adult. You know? <laughs> I, I think there's something in this though. I don't know if you, if you've, any of you seen the stunt that Petta pulled uh, a couple of years ago now, and they were in the street giving people glasses of milk. And it was a, they were billing it as a different type of milk. This is a new milk. Taste it and see what you think. And they were drinking it. And it, so told, really quickly, this is uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals. Exactly. It, right? yeah. And it was, um, it was rat's milk or cat's milk or milk from animals other than cows. And people were obviously disgusted. But in essence, that's what milk is. <laughs> it's the that's milk so of another animal. <laughs> yeah. It is kind of random. Yeah. Like we're the narrow band of animals where it's acceptable to drink milk from them. You know, it's like you got <laughs> exactly. sheep maybe or big cheese for that, goats, <laughs> yeah. cows, and then everything else is verboten. A little, little weird. Do you eat or can you eat milk? Like if it's in, on, in, on cereal, are you eating milk or are you still drinking it? Oh. Hmm. oh I, I, I grappled with this for way too long. Yeah, I, I don't know. You, I think you both eat and drink it because you eat it and then you like finish both? off the like fruity okay. milk at the end, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, you do. All right, very good. Glad we settled that one. Uh, uh, Rahul has got a final unpopular opinion for today. Uh, Rahul's got one on uh, in-store sales. Rahul, what's your unpopular opinion? Uh, yeah, some recent U.S. Uh, Commerce Department data for Q1 showed that e-commerce growth is slowing while in-store spending remains strong. And I, I think the intimation there is that people are going back to stores to shop. And I don't know if, I guess this maybe is an unpopular opinion because more people are doing this, but I'm not interested in that. I think beyond, you know, I think everybody's in a different place with their feelings on COVID and what's safe and what's not. But beyond that, I think, you know, due to issues like labor shortages, problems with staffing, the in-store experience a lot of times is terrible, especially if you're going to a big box store. I'm just like, I don't want to wander around like Home Depot for two hours looking for one screw. I just <laughs> buy it online and like, you know, click and collect is growing a lot here, but I'm just like all constantly kind of confused by all the people who are rushing to go back into stores because they're having such a great experience there. Hmm. I think the only thing harder than finding a screw in the Home Depot is finding an employee who can help you find said screw. Sometimes they run from you. <laughs> yeah, I swear yeah. they're actually <laughs> trying to get away from me. I've chased them down aisles before. Yeah, it's interesting because I guess someone going back doesn't necessarily convert to them spending the same amount of money. So right. like, I'm looking at our forecast uh, for retail e-commerce sales. And it grew, uh, retail e-commerce sales, online shopping grew 32% 2020, 14% 2020, well, 15% 2021, 14% this year will grow another 14% next year. So this isn't slowing down. This year, e-commerce will account for uh, 15% of retail sales. Next year, 17% of retail sales. So the dollars are still going up. I think maybe people are visiting less frequently or when they get there, they're buying less or buying differently. So it, it is hard to tell because people going into stores, it may seem like lots of people are going to stores, but are they spending differently? Bill, UK, what do you think? You're asking the wrong guy. I don't go to stores to shop. No, never, no, never did. Never will. Never <laughs> I, did. I, I hate shopping. What do you mean, okay. never did? It was like, well, as soon as online shop? shopping became a thing, that was it. I, I was sold. Really? Never did. Well, I exaggerate, Mark, because of course I did right, a little fine. bit. Yeah, of course. All right, good. <laughs> Thank goodness. All right, that's all we've got time for for uncommon knowledge. It's time now for dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing that we've learned this week. And we start with Bill, because he won this week's Game of the Week. Bill, what do you have for us? Okay, I've never done this before, so I don't know if I'm doing this right. But when I was looking at regulations and laws around uh, social media, I was looking generally at laws in the UK. And I discovered that in 1986, the Salmon Act 
was passed by a United Kingdom Act of Parliament, which outlined legislation that covered legal and illegal matter within the salmon farming and fishing industries. So it became illegal to handle salmon in suspicious circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what the hell does that so mean? What's a suspicious circumstance? <laughs> what's well, apparently, at time? They should have gone with a fishy circumstance. Oh, oh right. very good. <laughs> Extra points for seven. <laughs> what does that mean? Like with a hood on? What does that mean? No idea. Wearing a cloak? Yeah, it's like druidic robes are bad. <laughs> no laughing while salmon fishing. That is, is that, highly <laughs> suspicious. Is that is that still on the books? It's not. It is. It is still on the yeah. books. All right. That is good. Very good. Um, all right. Uh, Stephanie, what do you have for us? Back, uh, back into the sea. So um, mm. if you've ever enjoyed uh, scallops, it's one of my favorite seafoods to eat. Did you know that when living, they have over 200 eyes? And they are Come very... Again? Over 200 <laughs> eyes. I, like eyes? Like, like to eyes see to with. see. To see with. To see with in the sea. Um, oh, oh. Yeah, no. I'll keep going. Um, but I highly encourage everyone on this call, anyone who is listening, to please Google image search live scallop eyes, and then you are so welcome for the nightmare material. <laughs> oh, okay. I nearly did it. I nearly, I was this close. Never, nope. No, I won't. Yeah. Uh, wow. 200. <laughs> Over Can 200. Can they see like exceptionally well then? Or like, does that, uh, I, I, is that, 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 that I, that I don't know. They might or be 200. Or do they 200. need 200? It might because be 200 pretty mission. bad eyes. Yeah. yeah. I have to follow up on that one. All right. <laughs> Interesting. Nightmare at the opticians. Yeah, they're, hor- <laughs> they're horrifying Silly looking. Jokes. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not Googling it. I'm not doing it. Uh, Rahul, <laughs> what do you have for us? Yeah, so you inspired me to widen my horizons or at least try to. And I looked up some fun facts about F1 racing. Uh, the yes. Ones, so this comes courtesy of hotcars.com. <laughs> so okay. I'll leave it to the so listeners official. to decide if they yeah. think that's a trustworthy source. It I just wanted like... to pr- put that out there. <laughs> but according to Hot, hot Was cars- it Hot Wheels? Did you say <laughs> hotwheels.com? <laughs> A little toy. Okay, go on. Sorry. <laughs> so the things that popped out at me were that the steering wheels can have upwards of twenty-five buttons on them, and I Google image searched those, and they look like like a yeah. Nintendo Switch on steroids or something. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> and Formula One cars can accelerate from zero to hundred miles an hour, and then back to zero within four seconds. Like, how many G's are these guys pulling? That's pretty <laughs> impressive. I think the next one's like kind of related that uh, drivers can lose up to I think three kilograms of water per mm-hmm. race just from sweating which is kind of astounding i don't know can you guys convert that to stone for me <laughs> uh, three, shout out to my european kilograms. bros i don't uh, know it's okay you don't have to pounds do is <laughs> it's about seven pounds wow yeah mm-hmm. so uh, those were the things that kind of just popped out to me as the most interesting factoids I, I mean there's another one that was about how through like downforce f1 car can theoretically drive on the ceiling which i don't know has anybody ever actually tried to do that because i would actually pay money to watch that That'd be cool yeah yeah <laughs> Yes, yeah, true. The, st- the steering wheels are insane. There's way too many buttons going on. The uh, they've likened driving an F1 car to flying a plane because of the g-force and how fast they go. You go up to you know 200 miles an hour, then you're going into a corner at 60, then you're slamming on brakes and acceleration into 140 again. So it's remarkable. And then uh, what was the last thing you were talking about? Sorry. Um, oh, the downforce is how you can like theoretically oh, no, drive on the, the ceiling. The penultimate thing. Sorry. The oh, thing that, that you lose like three cal- kilograms of oh, water. Oh, yes. Yeah. After each race, the race drivers are weighed to, to check wow. to make sure they didn't lose too much. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, um, it's yeah, definitely it's a lot more impressive than NASCAR. I'll grant you that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> extremely low. It's literally the worst sport. Okay. Actually, Blake, if you're listening, golf is still golf. Uh, okay. I've got one point. Why extending, an o- <laughs> why extending an olive branch means to end a conflict? Um, so this is inspired because I was I read uh, a lot is generous, but a fair amount of historical fiction. I'm reading a five part book a series on Julius Caesar, uh, historical fiction, and they mention olive branches every now and again. Not much, but a little bit. Uh, so to extend an olive branch, it's a phrase that most people have heard of, but what does it really mean? Why an olive branch? What is the significance of that? Well, the olive branch has long been known as a symbol of victory, peace, and purity. It has historically been worn by brides, carried by doves, and made into wreaths. It has a biblical origin. It comes from the book of Genesis. The sign that the flood was over was an olive branch brought back to the ark by a dove 
To extend an olive branch is an ancient symbol meaning let us make peace. It indicates a willingness to bring a conflict to a conclusion. It's because olive trees take years to mature and war is typically very hard on olives because people cannot take the time to nurture and plant new trees. Therefore, the offer of an olive branch would suggest that someone is tired of war. And that's why. And that's all we have time for for today's episode. Thank you so much to my guests for hanging out. We thank Stephanie. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Thank you to Rahul. Always a pleasure. She was waving in case listeners, you didn't see that, but she waved. <laughs> uh, rather, <laughs> thank you, Rahul. Thank you to Bill, this week's winner of the Game of the Week. Thanks, Marcus. It was a lot of fun being this side of the microphone. Good, good. Thanks for hanging out. Congratulations on winning the championship belt. You have to give it back next week, but you got it for now. Uh, thank you to Victoria. She edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening. To ask us questions or just say hi, you can email us at podcast.emarketer.com. We'll see you guys on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an eMarketer podcast made possible by MParticle. By the way, my fiance is a freak and does the like weird arm folding. This is the other way around? Yeah. It's madness. Oh, I saw that's... this. So, so what, what was it? If you, so I do that, right hand on. Yeah, that's, I feel like it, right over left. Right Wait, when you fold your phone. arms, which hand's yeah. on top? My right hand. Is on top? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wait, so I'm I'm the freaky one? I wait, thought wait, the wait, left, wait. left on top was the weird one. This is the weird one. <laughs> wait, how are you doing? Well, it looks so relaxed. Wait, right? uh, <laughs> very cool. <laughs> the rap video is about to happen. Wait, Stephanie, do it normally? How do you normally do it? Right over left. Oh, no, that's normal? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's the opposite to me, so it's weird. <laughs> I think me and Bill are doing it the same. <laughs> Stephanie, I still think you're doing it wrong. Rahul, how do you fold your arms? Were you on this episode? How do I fold my arms? Uh, yeah, uh, he's doing left, it like me. Left Wait. over right, I guess. Wait, one Come more on. time. Let me see again. I hold that pose. I can't tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're good. Yeah, that's, I, I didn't realize there's a wrong way to do it. There's a wrong way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are people that do it the opposite, and it's mad. And you're the arbiter of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just making uh, sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, control. keep them honest. <laughs> what about putting on pants? Which leg? Putting on pants, I usually hold them out and jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not right? Put on pants. I don't know. That's a good question. I think left leg. I first. go left first, then right leg. There's also a wrong way to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Left wait, left first. Learning so much today. And Dave Franklin does. Yeah, sock, left, yeah. sock, then shoe, then sock, then. Oh my God! No, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's a horror against nature. Yeah. Does that? <laughs>